Look at somebody say, get in, get in the game. Say, get out of the bleachers and get in the game. Oh, that got quiet. All right, here we go. I don't have much time. We've got a lot to do today, a lot of fun stuff. And today, today could be the turning point for your life where at your last breath you can look back and say, I made a decision that day to finally surrender myself to God and let him use me. And because I did that, lives were changed, people grew, I grew, the kingdom of God grew. Today could be that day. And so let's talk about this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He's talking about the church now. Listen, God didn't just say, I'm going to die on the cross and just, and, and, and you know, that's going to be, if you put your faith in that, you're going to be saved and that's it. I'm going to save you and set you. That's not, he set this church up, this church, this structure. There's God, God said, look, uh, uh, I'm, I've got some purpose here. I've got some things that need to be accomplished. So he's, Paul is talking to them, and uh, you've got to know these are the foundations of these churches, and so he's having to teach and do things. So here it is. He gave some apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, that is a pastor, and teachers to do what? To equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Now, can't chase squirrels, but I'm going to chase this squirrel. How many, would you, how many in here would say, without raising your hand, the way the church is set up, especially here in the South, would you say that the church structure is the saints are equipped to do the work of the ministry, or is it the pastor who does the ministry? The pastor. Do you know that's not biblical? Here's why. I am one man. Jesus was one man. He discipled 12. The Son of God discipled 12. He didn't disciple 3,000. And there's a reason for that. If every person in this place, listen to me, if every person in this place started walking in the purpose to which God has created you, do you understand, listen to me, do you understand what would happen to the kingdom of God? Do you understand? Because your enemy, Satan, does. That's why he put so many doubts in you, and he wants you to look at your imperfections. Do you understand what would happen if I, as a pastor, Brandon as a pastor, our staff, that if we started equipping people and you allowed us to equip you to do the work of the ministry, what would happen? Do you get that? Jesus did. Here it is. All right. Until we all attain the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children. Say, don't be a, you've been wanting to tell your spouse this. Look at her say, quit being a kid. Tell them, you said, George said I could. <laughs> if, you, if you can't do that today, come next week. We're going to start a series for every love, and you'll, by the end of that, you'll say that. Uh, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, craftiness, deceitfulness. In other words, you need to know the word because if you know the word, you can spot a counterfeit a mile away. Rather speaking the truth in love. Somebody said it's okay to speak the truth, but how you do it matters in love. We are to grow up in every way unto him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, from the whole body, joined together, which is talking about the church, uh, by every joint with which it is, what's that word again? Equipped with each part is working properly. Say, I'm a part. I'm going to prove this to you in a minute. Makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Many people uh, are pastors or leaders. When dealing with the subject of serving, that's what we're going to talk about today. Think, and you may have come from a church like this. I did. Think the best way to get people to serve is to put them on a guilt trip. You ever been there? Right? Uh, see, guilt trips are like any other trips. Anybody ever been on a trip? It has a destination. And once you get to the destination, the guilt will end, and whatever you signed up for will end as well. Guilt is not a way to motivate people. I believe that serving the body of Christ comes by a heart change. 
I believe it comes from a heart change, which comes from an understanding. It comes from the Word. I also believe that in people's minds, they have a, legit, a legitimate reason why they don't serve. I hear it all the time. And uh, so I'm going to talk about some of those things today. Um, now, I have never in all my days, and I've been doing this since I was 21 years old, and I'm now a little older than 21 years old, I've never heard a church say, guys, we have just way too many people serving. Stop, y'all, y'all just quit. Too much like Jesus, just stop serving. Guys, we're having a get out of the game day. I never heard that, right? Get out of the game. We got too many people on the field. Uh, Lifeway just did a research this month. It just came out this month. They did a research and uh, a survey that asked churches, what are your greatest challenges? I say this month, it was January. We're out of January now, aren't we? The number one thing is we like leaders, we like commitment, and we like uh, the willingness of people to serve. That was, that was across the board, across America, mostly America, mostly America. Uh, Jesus addressed this in, in, in the book of Matthew. And uh, I'm going to read this to you, and we'll get into stuff. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching them in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Somebody say, when he saw the crowds. So, tell you, that was a bunch of people. You ever been somewhere and you said, this is crowded? Over here, y'all? Thank you. What did he do? He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. He said it's harvest time. The harvest is plentiful. Harvest indicates that something was planted Okay, that has now come to fruition. Something, there was an intention that has now come to pass. Uh, somebody in your life, if you're saved today, somebody planted the seed of the gospel, the hope of glory, grace and mercy. They planted something into your life. And do you remember the day when it, it came to fruition and there was a decision time? Okay. Okay, how about you in the cheap seats? Do you remember the day? See there? There's a benefit to not paying the big bucks like you guys. It was a day that that God began to draw my heart and I was ripe. I remember that, 1987. I was riding, I can tell you right now where I was at, I was in a, uh, about a 79 Monte Carlo by myself, drinking a baby bull. Remember baby bulls? They were great at throwing at mailboxes when you drank them. I was drinking a baby bull. I was eating McDonald's french fries. I was by myself. I was jamming out. I was right in front of where Waffle House is right now. And it wasn't audible, but it was undeniable. God of heaven asked me a question. Do you like the way you're headed? And this is the way you intend to spend the rest of your life. It was a sobering question. Uh, No longer was I with my buddies just partying. It was me by myself doing what I was doing, and I was probably going to look for other things. But it was a sobering question. It was a time of ripeness. It was a time of question. And I had to say, I I didn't. I didn't. Uh, The harvest... The harvest was ready. Something had been planted into my life, and it was now time to make that decision. And Jesus, Jesus has an urgency in his speech here. He has an urgency in his speech. He has compassion. He sees the crowds. They have, they have no shepherd. They have no guidance. They're just wandering around. And he says to his disciples in this urgency, look, we're not lacking harvest. We're lacking labor. And Jesus says, growing a, co- a crop, if you've ever done this, Growing a crop, planting the seed, is, is a long and slow process and requires patience, right? When you're growing it and you're waiting on it, but when something is ripe and it's ready to harvest, all right? If it's not harvest, harvested quickly, it'll rot. 
it's not pulled off the vine quickly, it'll perish. It takes a while for it to come to that point. And there's people that you've been praying for and people that you've planted the seed of love in and planted the gospel in and all those things. And you say, I don't think they're ever going to get it. But you don't know what's going on underneath and you don't see it. But I want to tell you, there comes a time when it's time for harvest and it's there. And Jesus says, we can't let it rot. We, we, I need laborers to go in there now. You, you know the parable of the, of the uh, guy who keeps getting workers to go into his field. He's got to get his harvest in. And he goes back the 11th hour. He's got to give his harvest in. Why? Because if not, it'll perish. Jesus says, this is where we're at. This is where we're at. A harvest that is not brought in at the right time will fail to produce what it was planted for and waste all the efforts and resources that went into producing it. And Jesus tells us that having a harvest is not the problem. Uh, turning point, and those of you listening online, how many of you know that people who are far from Jesus, they're not hard to find? How many, how many of you know that broken people are not hard to find? Come on, somebody. How, how many of you know that divorce isn't going to the negative, it's going to the positive. How, come on, folks. How, how many of you know that families are splitting and, and, and people are, are, are just, just losing their mind? How many of you know, come on, how many of you know the harvest is plenty? Come on, it's plentiful. You don't have to look very far to find somebody who needs Jesus or needs somebody to love them. Or, come on, it's plentiful. Jesus said the harvest is not the problem. The problem is the people to take care of the harvest when it's ripe and ready. And Jesus is talking about people in this harvest. He's not talking about wheat and peaches and, and persimmons and figs. So I want to break this down. 99% of the people who walk in our doors, drop their kids off in children's church, sit in a chair, experience worship, listen to a message. 99% of those people are ripe and they're ready to harvest and some seed has been planted in their lives and it, it, it's, it's taken root and it's sprouted and they're ready to be something more than they are. You know, if, if they weren't, they wouldn't have showed up on Sunday. I know when I came to the church, I, there was something stirring me. God had called me and I wanted to be a part of something bigger than me. I needed people to surround me. Come on, somebody. You, you understand how the church worked and and these people show up and they want God to do something in their lives. They want God to do something in their marriages because they're out of options. They done tried everything. And so that, that's, that's where we're at. And Jesus says those kind of people are plentiful and they must be harvested quickly because if not, there's a lot of options out there, right? There's people who come to church looking for an answer. And if we don't have the answer, we just let them come in here and walk out and say, great job. I want to tell you how many of you know the enemy has answers? How many of you know the enemy has options? Come on, somebody. You, how many of you know the enemy don't mind putting somebody in their life? How many remember when the enemy put somebody in your life and it was a wrong somebody and they just kept leading you deeper than what you was trying to come out? But when they walk into the church, we need people who, who are harvest-minded. says, come on, we got to surround them, love them. They can't be just like a sheep without a shepherd because there's a wolf out there. And, and if they get off by themselves, they're going to be destroyed because it's the, the, the devil's will to, to kill and to steal and to destroy. But come on, aren't you glad that Jesus came to give life? we got to be a life-giving place. A life-giving place. Notice that Jesus didn't say the harvest is plentiful, but the people are few. He said laborers. Laborers. You ever notice you never have to, you never have to uh, get somebody, work hard for somebody to show up to a fish fry? You ever notice you, not, you don't have to work hard for somebody to show up to a crawfish ball? Right? <laughs> They're always there, right? There's always, no, he, he didn't say this. He said laborers. In essence, the word labor means to serve, to serve. But notice this, he said, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest, to send laborers into the harvest. The mission was the same, bringing the crop that was ready. But it took different people to bring in the harvest. It wasn't just one type of person to bring in the harvest. It took all kinds of people to bring in the harvest because there was so much to do in the harvest there's people who bring in the harvest there's people who have evangelistic hearts that's what i am i, I man I, I will talk to anybody I, I pray every day where i'm at god 
let me be sensitive to the Spirit because wherever I'm at, I'm at, you know a person's heart, you know what they're going through, let me be sensitive because I want to reach and love that person. But discipleship is not my gift. It is so very important, but there are people that are just so good at discipling. That's, that, that's their thing. They're, that, they're just disciplers, and it takes all kinds of people because you can't disciple who ain't reached. So I'm a net guy. I'm a net guy. Then there's other people that clean them. Come on, there's people that drive the boat. Come on, somebody. There's people that clean the nets up there. It takes all kinds of people, right? It, it just, one guy with a sickle. Cutting wheat. No, no. You had to have somebody pick it up, put it in, and it had to bring it to a threshing floor where they took the wheat and they threw it up in the air on a windy day. And they'd throw that wheat in the air and it had chaff on it, which was, it was like a, sh uh, a skin on a peanut. You know what I'm talking about? You ever had that and you smile and you got it stuck on your teeth? Your wife goes... Right? That's what it was. And they'd throw it in the air and the wind would blow and it'd blow that chaff off and the wheat would fall. And then you, then you had to crush it and then you had to bake it and make it. You, do you understand? There's a long process. There's so many people that God sent in my life that helped me get to where I'm at today. And I still have people in my life that are helping me go, hey, God's going, come on, let's go this way. And I got to have people who have been there. The different types. Different talents, different giftings, different experiences. There's so many different experiences in this place. There's people who've been in prison in this place. There's people who are doctors in this place and lawyers and welders and da-da-da. And you've got all kinds of backgrounds. Some of you came, in, came up in an abused home. Some of you came up in a very religious home. Some of you came up with, with the cleavers. Three square meals a day and you sat there and you had your tie on for dinner. We love you. We don't understand you, but we love you. You're needed. He said, pray. You know, there's a novel idea. Pray. I've been praying, God. Work on people's hearts. Work on people's hearts. That's why I said guilt trips don't work. Only heart change can. An understanding of why I'm here. I've been, I've been praying to the Lord of the harvest, to the Father, to work on the hearts of people. You know, and ask. I've been asking people, I've been asking God, why are people so reluctant to become laborers for him? I've been asking God this. And God doesn't just need one type of person. He needs many different types of people to bring in the harvest. And we're all gifted different for different reasons. I want to read one more thing to you, and we're going to break this down. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and you've, you've heard this. This is this again, he's he's talking to the Corinthian church and he's having to explain the church how it's set up. Just as the body is one and has many members. Look at Romo, oh, not Romo, I wish. <laughs> Prescott. I am one body. Do, do you know that? With many members. What's that? Y'all, cheap seats. Thank you. Boot, I knew that was coming. <laughs> Neat. Do you know every part of my body needs every part of my body? For instance, I'm going to jump ahead here. How can the eye say to the hand, I don't need you? Ever had something in your eye? Do you go, pff, 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 pff. <laughs> huh? What do you do? Watch this. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. Uh oh. For in one spirit we are all baptized into the body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. We're all made to drink of one spirit. That's a spiritual baptism, not a water baptism it's talking about. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm an eye, or, or the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body if the whole body were an eye. Where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell? 
But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, and he chose, as he chose. In other words, before you were born, God said, I'm going to gift you. I'm giving you a purpose, okay? There's not everybody going to be alike. Isn't that so cool about the body of Christ? This church, somebody said, that church is so diversified. I don't understand how it works. I said, well, read the New Testament. If we're all a single member, where would the body be as it is? There are many parts, yet one body that I cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor can the head to the feet. I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. We don't have to go into that which are more presentable parts, do not require. But God so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body. In other words, there's not one greater than the other at all. Even the ones you can't see. How many of you know your liver? We got livers in here. They're not up front people. Right? Matter of fact, there's people, there's livers bad analogy but livers working at this church today and you never see them but without them it would be bad there may be no division in the body but the members may have the same care one for another if one member suffers all suffer together if one member is honored they all rejoice together now you are the body of the Christ and individually members of it so after wrestling with the question of why people do not serve uh for starters, in the local church, let's just start here. Let's just start right here on a, on a Sunday or a Wednesday. Let's just, let's just go small because he, he, he's got greater plans than just that. But let's just start here. Why do people not serve in their local church after talking to people, asking these questions personally to them, uh, and just praying about this? I believe I'm going to give you the top three of many, but I'm going to give you the top three. Number one thing I hear is I'm too busy. I don't have time. Busyness, let me tell you. How, what's one of, what, what is one of Satan's greatest tools to defeat the church? I'm going to make them busy. See, blessing can be a blessing and a curse. Right? Basically, it's not a priority. How, how many, how many uh, today are going to make time to eat? How many are never really too busy to eat? It happens, right? Uh, you know, sometimes in life, that's the truth. There are seasons in our life when things happen. I understand this. But most of the time, it's about priorities. And some people just don't see the importance of serving in their local church. But anytime we, we can get the picture of making a difference in someone's eternity, think about this. By serving Christ and by serving others. Somebody said, I want, I want to serve Christ. I'm going to tell you how you serve Christ, by serving others. Hands down. I believe it will move up the priority list. I believe it will move up the priority list. I, I'm going to just say this, and I'm going to make some people really, 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 really mad. Okay? But you listen to me. Just get mad at me. And I'm not against this because my, my daughter cheered competition. My daughter, mother, daughter played competition, volleyball, understand all that. What we are seeing, Brandon and I are seeing, is we have a generation of kids that are coming up and they're getting to be about 15, 13, 14, 15. They can't spell Jesus. And what happens is. About the time they hit four or five, there's so many things that, that are appealing, and I'm not against it. I'm not against it, but you've got you to gotta balance it because what happens is, all right, they can jack a ball out of a park, and I love it. I love it, right? Uh, they can do all those things, but what happens, and we see it. They get 13, 14, 15, they've got to start going crazy, and they start dragging them to the church like the woman caught in adultery. And go and do something. And the problem is they have no foundation. They have no foundation. And just like he said, they get tossed to and fro over every wind of doctrine. That's why they're like, uh-oh, they're hooked up with that church down there. And I, 
I'm bringing them to you. And they don't even know the truth about the gospel. It's about priorities. That is not about serving, but it is about serving. So that's what we're seeing of that. Uh, priorities are what guide us. It's what guide us. Number two, I have no idea what my gifting or purpose is. This is probably one of the greatest things I hear. We talk about gifting and purpose. I really don't know what mine is. And I won't ask you to raise your hand, but do you know what yours is? Okay, the, the majority will say no, okay? Uh, so, here's where the word equipping comes in. It is my job, it's the job of my staff, it's the job of these leaders, right? And this is why we talk about growth track, we try to do all these things to kind of see where you're gifted so we can equip you. How many of you know that if you're going to go hunting and I was going to equip you, uh, you would need a gun or a bow and arrow if you're going to hunt, right? How many you know, or if you're going to go fishing and you say, I need you to equip me, how many you know you'd probably need a rod and reel and some Zoom worms? Depends on what you're fishing for. How many you know that? How many you know that if you're going to open a bakery and you say, George, I need you to equip me, how many you know that I need to get you a, something to, I need, you need some flour for sure because you're going to bake, that's flour. You need some sugar and some eggs and some vanilla and some butter and beyond that, it re re what really matters. <laughs> so it is our job to equip you, to equip the saints to do the work of ministry, to equip you. So you say today, I don't know. I don't know what to do. It is our job to equip you, and we want to do that. We want to do that. We want to help you find your purpose and, and help you grow in your purpose. It's not going to be something you're on your own, okay? Uh, we have on-ramps, and we have off-ramps in this church. That's a good thing. Each ministry has an on-ramp, and it has an off-ramp. Try one out, and if it don't fit, exit and try another one. Have you ever had, went to a restaurant and you didn't like it? Did you quit eating at restaurants? Come on, peeps. No. If, if you, you go there and say, it's not a fit, try another one, but don't quit serving. You, there's something here that will fit your purpose that you were created for. Serving is about putting others ahead of ourselves. It's about following the example of Jesus it's about using our talents, our time to honor God, first of all, and to contribute to the growth of his body. And number three, this is, I think, probably something that is so big in Turning Point Church. And those of you who are listening around the world, and maybe you don't understand this, it's just kind of the culture of this area right here. It, it's very religious, and if you don't know what that means, I'm not talking about the good religion like feeding orphans and widows that Jesus talked about, what true, I'm talking about religion as in, Pharisaical, Sadduceical people who act like they're something that they're not. And this is what it breeds into. Here's something I hear in this church a lot. I don't feel needed or qualified. See? It's easy to walk in here and go, they got it all together. Oh, no, we don't. Oh, no, we don't. We put our Sunday face on and we make it happen. People call in on Sunday mornings, 10, 15 people. Five minutes for church. Can't be there. Guess what we do? We don't go, ah! Need people. No, we, we just make it happen. And so you walk in here, you go, man, they got it all together. I hear this a lot from people. My past disqualif disqualifies me. Or I'm a new Christian and I don't know a lot. See, I'm, I don't know a lot. If I, somebody asks me something, I, there's no way. Uh, or they have all the spots filled. What could I bring to the table? It, they got, look, I mean, look at this worship team. Have you ever paid attention to the 12 guys that Jesus chose? You, you need to. You need to do a study on the, on the 12 disciples of Jesus. Take a look at their qualifications and you will feel so much better about yourself. Yet they changed the world. Yet what we're doing today is a result of those 12 that it started with. They changed the world and they were the most unqualified people. Unqualified. 
Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Not follow me because you are fishers of men. You didn't catch that. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you. He didn't say, follow me because you already are. In the journey you will become. And I want to tell people here today, quit waiting to be qualified to serve. He will qualify you in the serving. He will qualify you in the journey. He just wants us to accept the invitation. I never went to seminary. I know some of you will leave over that. Some of you listening online will quit. I never went to seminary. Uh, I don't regret it a bit. I'm not against seminary. God had a different path for me. It was a wilderness path. It was, it was my path. I look back now, I understand why. Uh, yet he used me. He used me. My dad was not a pastor. He was furthest thing from it. Pipe fitter. My grandpa was a roughnecker. My other one was a carpenter. There's no, there's no preachers in my family. Right, we got everything else in the tree. None of the people that God used in Scripture were really able to do what he called them to do. Hear me on this. They were just available. So God worked through them just like he wants to do with us.